like many of us here, I love going beyond the ordinary, going beyond my comfort zone and pushing boundaries. We've heard amazing stories of pushing boundaries in the space of culture, technology, marketing, in various areas of our society. And the question is, how are we pushing boundaries in our personal life? How are each of us individually pushing boundaries on a day-to-day -day basis? My journey with pushing boundaries started quite early on. So while I was two or three years old, my parents have noticed that I have a, a very developed tendency of spending time with myself rather than with other little human beings like me. And in time, that has developed into me running away from our guests to solve math and physics equations. While that was cute for a little while, it stopped being cute quite fast. So my parents took me to a child psychologist. Now, bear in mind, this was Romania, 1980s, still communist Romania. So the child psychologist concluded um, quite fast uh, that I am mentally unwell. That's as far as he could go. Well, luckily, my parents didn't take that label as a fact and started going beyond the ordinary, started pushing boundaries and exploring other ways in which they can maximize my potential. And so I've done everything from gymnastics, ballet, tennis, martial arts, painting, dancing, singing, everything under the sun. And things have improved quite a bit. So across my teenage years, I was A-OK. -okay. Um, the game changed rather abruptly when I was 17, and my father passed away from a heart attack. So at that point, I decided to push my boundaries yet again and leave home at 17 with 300 euros in my pocket and with a huge passion that was inspired by my father, a physicist to find out how the world works, to find out how things work, and to find out how we work as human beings, to understand each and every one of us. And the first big mission I set for myself was to push boundaries in the space of knowledge, academia, and professional pursuits. So fast forward, five degrees in finance, economics, investment banking, uh, published book on microfinance, and spent about a decade in investment management and strategy across Germany, London, and other areas in Europe. And I came with a, that, that journey came with a key insight, a key learning, that if I'm very clear about the goal that I aim to achieve, and I bring together the most sophisticated, state-of-the-art data, tools, technology, insights, and people, I can make almost everything happen. Yeah, it took me 10 years to figure that one out, but it was worth it. <laughs> and beyond that, I thought, well, let me try pushing other boundaries. So I went into my physical boundaries. I thought, I'll take it easy. Uh, but still do something extreme, just like every other respectable investment banker. So I decided to walk 860 kilometers from Irún to Santiago de Compostela in about 19 days. That's about 52 Ks a day, 19 consecutive days. And then I thought, well, that's great, but it's a little bit boring. So I thought the next thing, I'm going to climb the tallest mountain in Africa. But I was running out of vacation days. So I went up and down in three and a half days because I needed to get back to the office. All of that was incredibly inspiring, motivating, empowering. But what I didn't realize at the time was that it all came at a price. And the price of Asperger's, arrhythmia, asthma, sleep deprivation 
were all things that I was ready to pay for and I was paying for. <laughs> what I wasn't quite in for was a severe thyroid condition, which was diagnosed in my mid-20s. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to throw myself in the hands of medical experts and do whatever they tell me to do. So fast forward five years, uh, taking ever-increasing doses of hormones on a day-to-day -day basis. And at the end of the five years, the conclusion was, well, we're kind of sorry, but it didn't work. So all of the different things I've tried over five years, it actually didn't work. I was as healthy or unhealthy as at ground zero. So that's when I kind of broke up with my doctors and started a very intimate relationship with data, science, genetics, and natural health therapies. Across two years, I've done everything from reading hundreds of research papers, looking at my genetics, and engaging with acupuncture, osteopathy, massage, yoga, meditation, every form of meditation on the planet. The good news was that after about two years, I felt like a million bucks. All I needed was to make it official. So I went to the most reputed endocrinologist in London, and I underwent a series of tests. And to his surprise, not to mine. I was A-OK. -okay. No tumors, no hormonal imbalance, and blood values were A-OK. -okay. Then I thought, OK, how do I celebrate this, this renewed sense of being healthy again? Luckily, a friend jumped at my rescue and said, I have the perfect thing for you. I said, well, you know, has it been done before? What is it? She says, it's never been done before, and it's for an educational charity. So it's perfect for you. Brilliant, I'm in. Well, the, the challenge was um, endearingly called the Triple Seven Challenge. And that stands for seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. The first six went incredibly well. We finished the sixth one in Chile, happy days, lots of energy, lots of adrenaline in our blood, and we were really ready to navigate the last 10 hours before gaining two Guinness World Records. So we get on the plane, and we're about to land when the pilot comes and says, um, I'm deeply sorry, but it looks like the weather is really bad. A lot of winds and ice. Well, we surely think that's a joke, because we were talking about landing in Antarctica. So none of the ice should have been a surprise. <laughs> anyway, fast forward the third attempt into um, Antarctica. We land, we do the marathons, finish, all good. Now, the good news of the story was that all of this marathon, on the plane, off the plane, marathon, on the plane, off the plane, marathon, gave me enough time to think, what am I all about? What am I good at? What do I love doing? What's my purpose? How can I use my knowledge, my insights, and my experience to make other people's journey to, to health to healthiness a lot easier and fun, as well as personalized, because each of us are very, very different. So it made me question what health is all about. And in antiquity, health was embodied by these gorgeous-looking young women with a snake around their body, which symbolized vitality, growth, wisdom, and the English etymology of the word health is hail, which means whole, to be whole as a human being. And I think health over the past decades has been, centuries has moved quite far from that concept. In Asia, the idea was that you go and see an acupuncturist and you pay for the sessions 
as long as you're healthy. When you stop being healthy, you stop paying. So when did we start paying for being ill? There are a few insights over the past 400 years. And it started with an insight from John Locke, a reputed philosopher. And he said, it's all about life, liberty, and property. A couple of hundred years later, Thomas Jefferson adapted that in the US Declaration of Independence and said, it's all about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, today, yet another couple of hundred years later, the paradigm has shifted to be all about life, liberty, and healthiness. Because ultimately, if we don't have health, if we are not healthy, we cannot enjoy property, and certainly not enjoy our friends, our family, the typical sources of our happiness in our life. So now, I would like to ask you for a favor. If you look back at the past decades and you look at our healthcare system, we spend over 10% of the global GDP purely on healthcare. And of that, 75% of that, an overwhelming percentage, is purely cost related to lifestyle and preventable disease. So that's everything from stress, diabetes, heart conditions, back pain, anxiety, depression, weight. We have one in six Europeans that are obese, and we have 10% of the US population which has diabetes. And we, have, we are spending over 600 billion euros every year purely on stress-related conditions. So obviously, the system is broken. The system is not doing what it's supposed to do. We are looking at health as being the absence of disease. And we are not looking at the individual, at each of us personally, as a whole. So now the favor. I'd like you to take 20 seconds, not more. And I'd like to give you to give me your undivided attention and observe everything you possibly can about me. And I will do the same about you. How does that feel? Do you feel relaxed, aware, energized? Well, this was just a small sample of a meditation practice. This is a practice that we've been doing for millennia. Where there is a mental break, a pause, or a minute of meditation, or a moment of prayer. We've been engaging with these practices for millennia. What has changed over the past few decades, however, is the distractions brought about new sources of communication, technology, media. And while some of these are beneficial, what we see now is that we are bombarded every 10 to 15 seconds with new pieces of information. And our tools around us query us nonstop around, did we get enough sleep? Did we walk enough steps? Is our heart rate variability at the right level? Did we have enough blueberries? Did we have our kale smoothie this morning? So we are overwhelmed with all of this data. The, so the question is, how do we leverage technology, data, science, and our personal insights in a way in which we can focus, focus on one single health goal, and then identify the three most powerful activities and nutrients that we can engage with, we can genuinely focus on and engage with on a day-to-day -day basis. 
That is the opus magnum of personal health excellence. Knowing exactly what are the smallest changes that each of us can make on a day-to-day -day basis to maximize our health potential. Now imagine you knew that you're predisposed to gluten intolerance. And you're having dinner with a good friend, you're both having pasta, and he's feeling A-OK, -okay, and you're feeling quite bloated and unwell at the end of the dinner. Well, you might feel guilty thinking, oh my god, I've ate too much. <laughs> but the reality is that your genes might not be designed for you to easily process gluten. Or imagine that you're predisposed genetically to hypertension. And you're at dinner and you're having a glass of wine, you're having a nice spicy curry, and then you feel like you're becoming quite verbose, you're, you're very passionate about every word you say. You feel a little bit awkward, and you're thinking, well, what should I be doing differently? But actually, it's just your genes speaking to you and saying that you're predisposed to hypertension, and red wine and spicy curry might not be the right combination for you. Or imagine that you have a high sensitivity to sweetness built into your genes, like me. And I feel there's never enough chocolate in this world. <laughs> While my friends are perfectly A-OK -okay with crackers and biscuits. <laughs> so the idea is bringing together state-of-the-art genetic science, technology, and data to create your very own you manual to maximize your health potential. And doing all of that in an easy, fun, and personalized manner. I believe that health technology, just like art, science, and us human beings, serve a purpose to make life easy, healthy, and fun. Your very own you manual brings to life exactly that. Your maximum health potential in an easy and fun way so that you can take charge of your health today. Thank you very much. <laughs>